Welcome to the Reasoned Roundtable, your flagship podcast from the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I am a Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Catherine Mangu Ward, and special guest star, Reason senior producer and uh, just asking questions co-host Zach Weissmuller. Hi, Howdy, everyone. Hey. hey. Uh, those of you who are watching this, uh, you'll note that Catherine is not in her usual location. She's up here in New York uh, for Fleet Week. She's <laughs> greeting all the sailors. I just like to the... welcome the, what do we call them? The boys in white? I like yeah. to welcome them to New York By the City. By who look white. unbelievably awful, sailor suits are the worst. Oh, I disagree. Think? I think they're, I love them because it's like. It's unforgiving. They just look so, they look so crispy walking around Times Square. Yeah, I don't know. That's what I mean about that. She hates her uh, government, but I, she loves her sailors. I just watched uh, On the Town oh, in honor of Jesus Fleet Week, Christ. Nick, and uh, oh, it's fantastic. It does fantastic. prove uh, uh, no, the no. Uh, Ava Gardner saying about uh, about Frank Sinatra, though, right? About his weight and the proportions <laughs> of his body that account for it. <laughs> let's, let's just start off on the right third I, foot. Uh this weekend, <laughs> this weekend uh, saw what was, uh, I think, undoubtedly the most eventful Libertarian National Convention in the party's 53-year mm. history. The, Don't you think some eventful? weird stuff went down did, in the in the 70s and early 80s? No. I think it did. No. It's w definitely weird, but like most and yeah. okay. event, right? It's I don't know. I wasn't the there, weirdest. so we'll, we'll let the callers tell there us. There wasn't. I don't recall a former and perhaps future uh, president being at a previous convention for any third party. Vivek Ramaswamy party, has not, not been president yet, Matt. He can only be a future president. <laughs> uh, just, are you yeah. sure? I think he's president of uh, yeah. BuzzFeed uh, uh, increasingly. Uh, anyways, uh, Donald Trump uh, spoke there uh, amid uh, cheers yeah. and uh, booze and, and audience scuffling and star child, <laughs> the heroic... Star Child being wrestled to the ground, uh, which is no good. Um, and uh, Trump told delegates that they should vote for uh, him if they want to get used to winning instead of getting uh, 3%. <laughs> um, you also had him promise to, uh, that was his words, not the necessary historical uh, performance of the uh, Libertarian Party in presidential elections. He uh, promised to appoint a Libertarian to his cabinet if and when he is elected and more momentously uh, to the crowd. Uh, and I think in general, a promise to commute the sentence of uh, of uh, Ross Ulbricht, the uh, founder of uh, Silk Road, um, who is serving consecutive life prisons. Um, there uh, also was Robert F. Kennedy spoke there and tailored his speech more towards the libertarian audience. He, uh, unlike Trump, allowed his name to be entered into the nomination where uh, he received 2% and then was eliminated after the first round was of voting. just ahead uh, of, uh, you know, Sean Ono Lennon, right? And Courtney Love, uh, Dan and Marino. Stormy Daniels, the, the misspelled Courtney Love. Joe yeah. Montana also got the write-in yeah. game yeah. Uh, for the Libertarian Party remains just strongly on point. O.J. Simpson. <laughs> so yeah. Votes. Uh, leaders of the party's uh, combative Mises Caucus, who took control over the body uh, two years ago at the uh, uh, LNC in Reno, Nevada, in what's called the uh, Reno Reset, um, they won their re-election. Angela McCarthy, chair of the party, and uh, Karen Ann Harlos, the secretary, won their re-election. But uh, the presidential candidate that they want uh, did not. Dr. Michael Rechtenwald won on the first five ballots. They eliminate the low uh, man, in this case, uh, uh, in each round. And uh, he won the first five. But then on the sixth, Chase Oliver squeaked past him. And then on the seventh, Chase Oliver decisively beat none of the above uh, to uh, win the nomination. Uh, <laughs> Chase Oliver's anti-war activist from Georgia, most famous for um, uh, forcing, because of Georgia's laws, uh, the U.S. Senate race there to go into a runoff and ultimately tipping it towards the uh, Democrats um, uh, in terms of the control over the in entire United States Senate. One of the reasons uh, Rechtenwald did not win um, was that he kind of fumbled in his post-Trump speech press conference and left it prematurely, in part because the edible he had eaten had just kicked in. 
Um, and I'm not making that up. Uh, so we're going to get to Zach's on the ground reportage from Friday and Saturday, including his fantastic video of, uh, of the Donald Trump speech in particular. We're going to get to that in a moment. Mm-hmm. But Catherine, first, just like I'm tempted to say 10 out of 10, no notes. <laughs> <laughs> What's your reaction to the eventfulness? I have some notes. Um I guess uh, okay. my my notes would be uh, you know the same thing that I actually said uh, in the pre-convention podcast, which is that um, I would love it if the kind of serious and reasonable people were more dominant in in the Libertarian Party. And I know that that's like oh it was so fun, it was a spectacle, and it was wild and crazy. Um, but uh, it remains the case that the word libertarian in the American public's mind is associated with that party. And um, they they were still just being silly. They were just doing they were doing things that were um, fundamentally unserious in the public eye. The gummy gate just being one of kind of many um, fumbles. Uh, and I do think if you believe, as they say they do, that that part of the idea of this party is to win elections, they should act like it. They should act like something is at stake. Um, and I know that there were people there who took it seriously. And as I said last time. Um, there are plenty of like great, serious people in the Libertarian Party who are just trying to do their best. Um, but I sure would have liked a few more grownups in the room. Nick, uh, believe it or not, I follow you on Twitter. Yeah, and uh, there I saw you reacting with some, uh, that's a, at Nick Gillespie, by the way. Yeah. Uh, it's that's not the right. real Nick Gillespie. It's or I at am Nick, Nick Gillespie, Gillespie. Uh, on uh, Twitter. <laughs> Done. Um, mm. uh uh, I saw you out there uh, hyping Chase Oliver. You expressed some enthusiasm yeah. about the Libertarian Party nominee. Do you want to talk about your enthusiasm and maybe uh, contrast it to some of the uh, lesser enthusiastic responses from some of the people associated with the Mises Caucus? Well, I, I mean, to in in this sense, in hyping him, I said that uh, I don't have my Twitter account in front of me, uh, but it is at Nick Gillespie. Well, you can, you can yeah. remember your own uh, Vaguely, yes. I don't know. Yeah. You know I have uh, interns in uh, Singapore and uh, the, the Philippines that are doing most of that now, Matt. They also read it for me, so it all works Globalization. out. Globalization. We love to see it. Yeah. Uh, no, but uh, what I said was something along the lines of uh, what he lacks in name recognition, which is you know serious and is problematic. Uh, to get above 1% or whatever, Joe Jorgensen, she squeaked by a little bit uh, with that. He makes up for in kind of framing and analysis and principle, and he gave a bunch of great quotes to the uh, to the New York Times coming out of the gate. And part of it was like, hey, here's, you know, here's the deal. If you are living your life peacefully, you should be left alone to do what you want. You know, I like that. He's pro-immigration and pro-immigrant. He is anti-war. Uh, he broadly is very, um, uh, you know, is very libertarian in the old socially liberal, fiscally conservative mindset. He has shown himself to be a person of some poise when he was uh, pushing the Georgia 2020 Senate race into a um, uh, into a runoff uh, because the Republicans chose to uh, nominate a brain dead football great as a candidate uh, with fa- so many families he couldn't remember all of them and things like that. Um, so I think Oliver is is a pretty good standard bearer. And, and especially he's young. He's what, like 38 or something like that. He is, yeah. uh, he is openly gay and friendly towards alternative lifestyles, which I think is a great move for the Libertarian Party. Part of the problem with the Mises Caucus uh, and their appeal outside of a lot of people is that they were, you know, they were running against wokeness, uh, and they're very critical of anything having to do with gayness, anything having to do with drag queens, anything having to do with immigration, for that matter. I mean, they're fond of putting uh, hoppy in helicopters. You can Google it if you don't know what I'm talking about in their Twitter handles and things like that. I think Oliver brings a very solid, powerful, inclusive and forward looking uh, you know, message to the Libertarian Party. So I hope he does well. Um, but you know, it is going to be real tough uh, because nobody knows who he is, really. And uh, the Libertarian Party seems very fractured behind him. Dave Smith, who was, you know, the person in 2020 when Zach and I were covering the uh, the Libertarian uh, Convention, the Reno Reset, uh, all 2022, 2022. Me, all were saying, you know, what they wanted was Dave Smith as the presidential candidate. They were like Justin Amash, who was also there and, and making 
the rounds. Justin Amash is like, okay, but he's not really serious or a good communicator. You know, they were putting down a, a, a congressman who had served 10 years in, in the House of Representatives and, you know, pushing the podcast host of Legion of Skanks, among other things, who Dave is funny. He's a great communicator, but he's very, uh, you know, kind of anti-woke, anti-PC, anti-immigrant, anti-abortion, a lot of things that I don't think would reach very far outside of, uh, you know, Republican politics, to be quite honest. So I think Chase uh, is pretty good. Uh, and the libertarian leadership, certainly the Mises caucus people in their early responses, including Dave, have said, you know, they're not going to vote for Chase Oliver. Uh, and Dave even went so far as to say, ironically, uh, you know, Chase winning was the best outcome for Trump. Um, so, you know, it's going to be hard. The uh, Libertarian Party is beset with internal strife, not unlike the Roman Empire. <laughs> it's um, a famous line. Uh, uh, famous uh, Zach, line. Okay, read a book. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm just trying to imagine the uh, the Libertarian Party spreading roads yeah. for thousands of miles. <laughs> it's kind of hard to It's pay as you go. Uh, uh, pay go roads. Uh, Zach, you were there. Nick brought up, invoked Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump on Truth Social uh, said after the convention that he totally uh, would have won the nomination if his name had been entered, but he couldn't enter it because that's against the rules of the Republican Party. And uh, Trump is, is your nothing impression. if You're not a rule follower. Uh, yeah. People Trump are saying he's the best follower. rule follower. That's why we need him. I didn't realize we had interrupting cow. Uh, two of them mm -hmm. uh, on this podcast. Zach, uh, you were there reading the room. Would Donald Trump have won the nomination? No. He, so... This is what happened in during the Trump speech. Uh, he came out, uh, stood awkwardly for about two minutes while uh, Proud to Be an American played. And I assume that during that time, there's usually cheers and excitement. But in this case, there were just people booing and Star Child holding up a banner saying, um, we don't want a dictator. And uh, it, was, it was a very strange opening. And then he proceeded to announce that he actually is a hell of a libertarian, soliciting more booze, uh, and then asking the delegates to nominate him as the Libertarian Party president, and if not, at least vote for him. And then when soliciting more booze, uh, saying that they're never going to get above 3%. And... Then later in the speech starts throwing some bones out to the libertarian delegates. So the, my, my impression is that all of the fact, the Mises caucus faction, the classical liberal faction, none of them appreciated the way that Trump approached that speech. And that alone uh, would be, you know, a, a non-starter for him getting the nomination. I think R RFK had a much better received speech, and even he was only able to get the the two percent on the first round. So no, I, I don't think um, Trump had any chance of capturing the Libertarian Party nomination. They were insulted by the very mention of that possibility at the beginning of his speech. I think in the first round he got uh, six votes, and he might have gotten a, a couple of straggling you know, right votes. Had, had the, the isotoner ads like Dan Marino, he might have gotten eight or ten votes. I'm sure. Um, Zach, what do you think if Trump had spoken, obviously this wouldn't happen after Chase Oliver had gotten the nomination. Do you think his reception from the Mises caucus people would be different because they were, they were banking on uh, professor Rechtenwald, um, who they see, uh, you know, obviously he's not Dave Smith, but people were really backing him to the hilt who were, uh, Mises caucus people. Yeah, it's an interesting counterfactual to consider. Um, they tried to get the presidential nomination in before the Trump speech because they wanted their candidate to respond to Trump. And due to all sorts of other issues bogging them down, that was not uh, able to happen. Um, and so if that had happened... First of all, it's hard to imagine because I think part of why Rechtenwald lost is because of what happened at the Trump speech with Gummy Gate. Um, so it, it's possible that Rechtenwald would have 
won because he he performed fairly well in the debate. He was getting big cheers during the libertarian debate and then kind of fumbled the ball during the his big Trump moment. Um, but if that had happened, yeah, I think there might have been a, a different reception uh, to Trump by by the Mises faction. How uh, did he that, but... mess up? Like, was I mean, was he like, hey, man, I, I got to sit down or like how fucked up was he during the post Trump uh, press conference? Yeah, so the the way that Angela McArdle had sold this to the libertarian delegates is like Trump is going to get his moment and then there's going to be all this media on Trump and then we are going to be able to capitalize on that to get our message out. The reality of what happened is that as soon as Trump left the stage, most of the media cleared out of the room and a few reporters went up to the stage to hear Chase, Michael Rechtenwald, and uh, Mike Termat uh, give kind of a triumvirate of responses. Rechtenwald went first, uh, talked for about a minute, and then said, uh, I don't really want to do this. I don't want to participate in a Trump roast and walked off the stage. Uh, so that's how it went down. And then Chase stepped into the vacuum and delivered a pretty, he, he pretty much took over the press conference. And I think that was a big uh, moment for a lot of the you know, they both had their kind of committed supporters going in. But for people in the middle, I think that, you, you know, this was a this ended up being a pretty close thing at the end um, in the final round or, or the, the penultimate round. Chase got about 49 percent of the vote. He's close to the 50 percent mark and Rechtenwald had 44 percent. So it's a close enough margin where, you know, the gummy was not the only determining factor, but it, it could have been, uh, it, you know, it, it could have been like the deciding factor. What uh, drug do you think Chase Oliver was on during the press conference? Uh, uh, pr probably uh, what's the uh, the one that's uh, being cracked down on now? It's a, the, the focus drug. Um, Adderall? Adderall? Adderall. Adderall. Yeah, you You need some. You're short there, Zach. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, I do. That's, <laughs> uh, now you can <laughs> take that to your doctor and get a prescription. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, Rechtenwald was yeah. the only one of the of the major candidates to uh, say that he welcomed Trump being invited there. The rest of them were all pretty well opposed to it. He had also said in a tweet in 2022 that um, he was watching a Trump, a Trump speech somewhere and he got tears in his eyes because it was so moving. So he'd been the most kind of like a, uh, like expressing the most positive noises. Uh, towards Trump. Um, and uh, it should be said that Angela McArdle also, when uh, offered opportunities to uh, talk about Trump, also didn't really participate in a row. She has criticized him, but uh, said he's clearly better than Biden. Um, and that, you know, like the, the first the first and most important thing about Trump is that he's really funny on Twitter, which, you know, he was uh, funny on Twitter back back in the day. Uh, uh, Catherine, um, getting a, a pledge to free Ross Ulbricht is pretty important, isn't it? If we think he's going to keep the pledge, I don't know. It feels like this. He just says stuff and then he does whatever he wants. But yeah, I like if that happens, fantastic. And in a way, I would say um, I don't think it was worth it to have him at at the convention and and sort of associated with the libertarian brand and the way that he ended up being. But um, of course, having having Albrecht out would be incredible. So uh, I guess if it happens, cool. I, I will say, you know, I think uh, talking to kind of normies, like people who don't pay attention to this stuff at all, all they know is the LP booed Trump. Like that was the headline. If they know anything, they know that. And it's like, OK, honestly, yeah, like the LP booed Trump isn't the worst narrative that could have come out of this by far. Um, I like that. I, I, I was kind of uh, impressed by the, uh, you know, the raucousness. I wish they had been a little bit more like that with RFK Jr. Uh, and I watched his speech, but it, it is true. RFK Jr., who needs the LP in a way that I think Trump doesn't or doesn't think he does, really tailored a speech to uh, libertarian uh, constituencies. And that was interesting because <clears throat> obviously Zach and I interviewed uh, RFK Jr. for 90 minutes or whatever, uh, uh, almost a year ago now. So, you know, we've talked to the guy and he's not libertarian, but there is a lot of places where he overlaps with a libertarian agenda. And in most of those instances, he's been leaning into it, talking about people like Assange and, 
and Albrecht and Edward Snowden, uh, you know, really embracing Bitcoin and cryptocurrency because it gets you away from the government, becoming a very strong free speech absolutist after really having a career where who's anything but. I mean, that's kind of interesting. And, and, you know, maybe if there's something to take away from this, because I agree with you, Catherine, like this is, you know, this uh, convention was a bit of a shit show. And like my friends who are not libertarian, but who felt a need to text me oftentimes late at night when most responsible people are trying to catch up on sleep and things like that. Um, it, you know, if there's something good coming out of this, it's that, there are a lot of libertarian issues that resonate very, very deeply with people. And they have things to do like, you know, medical freedom and bodily autonomy, free speech, uh, things like free trade, uh, you know, innovation in the tech sector and things like that. So I, you know, I don't know that the Libertarian Party is going to be gaining ground over the next couple of months, much less the next couple of years. But I found it good that, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, agree with libertarians on a lot of different issues. I don't think a single person perceived any of that from the convention, though. I mean, I, I agree with the sentence you just said, but I think what people heard was Trump was invited. So that's bad because it cements, in my mind, the ongoing confusion between libertarianism and the right. Um, and then they heard Trump was booed, which like, okay, libertarians are spicy and correct to oppose things that Donald Trump did. But I don't think anybody heard the words free trade. I don't think anybody heard the words bodily autonomy. I don't think anybody learned more about those important principles of the LP from this this news gambit. Like, I hope they learn about it from Chase Oliver, but I don't think they learned about it this weekend. Zach, when you and Nick covered the Reno reset two years ago, the um, leadership of the, uh, the the then victorious uh, leadership of the uh, of the takeover, self styled takeover of the party, um, said, "Hey, judge us by our fruits." In two years, so you were there, you saw the fruits. Um, what do we say about a caucus that will still have a lot of managerial control over the party for the next two years? Um, that. Uh, had different ideas about uh, presidency, um, and they were going to get a candidate that was all uh, set up in the podcast world, and they ended up with Dr. Michael Rechtenwald uh, uh, because their plan A um, decided not to for family reasons. Um, there's been you know, a, a redu reduction in membership. There'll be a reduction in state ballot access. Um, looking at the totality of it, what do you think about their fruits? Well let me just lay out what I think their case, the case that they will make will be, um, which is that um, their strategy is to, uh, uh, on one level, inviting um, Trump and RFK and Vivek Ramaswamy is, in, is to acknowledge that the Libertarian Party is not in a position to win the presidency this year or any time really in the foreseeable future. And so they want to use their potential spoiler status as leverage to bargain for something. For example, getting Trump to pledge to, to free Ross Ulbricht, whether that happens or not, um, that's one fruit that we will be able to judge how tasty it is or not. Um, no. <laughs> if it, if if um you know if something comes of that if trump delivers on that or biden is for some reason pressured to do something to try to win the libertarian vote i will give angela mccardle her due for that that's a real accomplishment ross Ulbricht should not be in prison um and so if the libertarian party can be used to extract something like that that is great and i'm i'm more than happy to give them credit for that um, you know, they're trying to pull RFK in their direction. He gave a speech uh, that was largely focused on the Bill of Rights. He's started to embrace the Second Amendment to try to court libertarian voters. So they would argue, OK, we're exerting influence on one of the, the major candidates. That's the role of a third party. Um, Angela McArdle won re-election fairly easily on the second round. Um, I think that in some sense, that was a vote of confidence by people who are not firmly in either of the camps. Um, they, I think that people there, generally when I was speaking with people, they were positive about the idea that 
this convention was drawing a lot of media attention. So they, they liked the move in some sense. I think there was, even among the Mises caucus, there was an appetite to boo Trump. I heard people talking about wanting to do that before he even came, if, if he didn't talk like a libertarian, which he certainly didn't. Um, so, and then um, what they, what every Mises caucus person I talked to from Angela McArdle to Michael Rechtenwald told me is that they're not focused on whether their candidate gets one, two, or three percent of the vote. They're focused on membership. And they kept talking about Harry Brown, the candidate in the 1990s who uh, was a well-known uh, writer and did not do very well in the presidential elections, but apparently uh, grew the membership of the party. And that is the model that they think they are following. And they say to judge them on whether the membership grows after the 2024 election and um, fundraising turns around. Yeah, you know, we'll see about that. But just very quickly, Matt, and Brian Doherty reported on this using uh, the LP's own filings since the 2020 takeover, membership was down and fundraising, you know, revenue was down. So it may turn around, but, you know, up to this point, and I don't know that I would want to put, you know, if this is the fruit that you're offering on the roadside stand, you know, and here I'm more with Catherine, you know, it's pretty meager. I mean, this is like a kind of gnarled zucchini or something, you know, that you're I selling. I will mention- yeah, I will mention that uh, Angela was telling us that as at, at the time I talked to her on Saturday that they'd raised close to 200000 from this convention at, up to that point, which uh, is not as high as they did during the Gary Johnson convention, but I think is maybe the second or third highest. Uh, we'll, I guess we'll see it at the end of the convention how much they hauled, but um their argument will be that uh, 2024, an election year, is really when it's fair to start judging them. And yeah. um, I think that's-, that's Adjust for inflation. They also ran fewer candidates yeah. over the past, according to their, uh, according to Brian's reporting and things like that. Because Matt, one of the other things was they were like, you know, it's ridiculous to focus on the presidency or even at statewide or even, you know, uh, like going for Senate candidates. That's a waste of time. We're going to focus on hyper local elections, blah, blah, blah. And they yeah. don't they have not provided those fruits or berries or nuts or whatever we want to call it. Um, so, you know, they I, you know, let I hope they do well, you know, but it's 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 bizarre. They have a very internally consistent model for social change and for what they're doing. And when they go out and actually touch the marketplace, it doesn't seem to be paying off. Um, so, and, and the, the, the narrative that they have about, uh, you know, about Gary Johnson and Bill Weld is that they were an embarrassment and a joke and they hurt the party. When you look at the actual numbers in terms of membership and fundraising and ballot access, a different story emerges. So we'll see. Yeah, if I could say one more thing about uh, Chase Oliver getting the nomination. Um, so we already went over what went wrong with Michael Rechtenwald. And Matt, you alluded to the fact that the Mises caucus's plan the entire time had been for Dave Smith to seek the presidency. Uh, if that had happened, I am fairly confident that the outcome would have been different. If Justin Amash had run, uh, I think he would have probably gotten the nomination. Um, just the, I think some level of profile and name recognition s matters to the candidates, uh, and they're willing to put aside differences for, for that kind of reach. Um, Chase winning, um, really, the seeds for that were sown on, the, on Friday when there was a fight over certifying delegates. So there was... Uh, there were these delegates from states like Michigan where these there's these kind of arcane legal fights about who are the real libertarian delegates from these various states. And the Mises caucus was trying to decertify delegates from various states, and they were unsuccessful in doing that. Had they been successful, they probably would have had the votes to achieve what they wanted. So in a sense, they were 
outmaneuvered, outpoliticked. Um, a lot of the credit goes to the classical liberal caucus, I think, who is their kind of counterweight in the Libertarian Party, who were able to organize and whip the votes to kind of preserve their delegates and then crucially convince the third place finisher, Mike Termott, to jump onto Chase Oliver's ticket. Uh, Rechtenwald, after losing, you know, characterized this as some betrayal that Termott was supposed to back him. So that kind of like, you know, uh, politicking really, they, I, I got to say they they got outmaneuvered somewhat and, and that was crucial to, to Chase taking the nomination. And now it's it's very unclear to me what the future of the Mises caucus within the party is. Um, Angela obviously still has the leadership position, but a lot of the high profile people are bailing from the Liber Libertarian Party. So I think the battle for the soul of the Libertarian Party is uh, still ongoing. Catherine, uh, to put a button on this uh, this first half here, uh, the uh, uh, president of Cato, Peter Gettler, uh, had a piece in the Washington Post before the convention, uh, fired a shot across the broadside of the Libertarian Party, saying uh, the political party pretending to be libertarian has transitioned to a different identity. It should at least have the decency to change its name too. Um, was that premature? I mean, I don't think he's wrong about the broader trend, which is, you know, first of all, he said Trump is not libertarian um, because the news hook was Trump's speech. And I think that's manifestly true, even if, um, you know, there is a partner or two that comes out of his presence there. Um, but uh, I think, you know, the Libertarian Party has been in unlibertarian hands, in my view. I think that there are that there are, you know, folks in the kind of Mises caucus faction who I would not particularly recognize uh, as the type of libertarian that I am. And of course, you know, for every two libertarians, there are three kinds of libertarianism, um, for sure. But um, I think the the fight for what people associate with that word is it's an important one to me. I think it's an important one to Peter Gettler. And, um, and I respect that he felt like he needed to come out and say something, right, as the some little chunk of the world's attention was turning to look at this, um, to look at this circus. Um, that said, uh, you know, I think Oliver is libertarian in a way that's recognizable to me. Um, and so I think he's a good option for people who don't like Trump and Biden. Uh, like, that's a reasonable vote to me, uh, even though the Libertarian Party organizationally and in some of its formal leadership, f formal leadership is, uh, you know, is not what I would consider at all ideal. Um, I also want to say there was a, the final ballot for Oliver where he almost lost to none of the above um, was uh, it really warmed, warmed my none of the above heart. Although I understand that those <laughs> none of the aboves didn't, they meant different things to different people. Let's yes, say that. That was, that was an attempt to, I think, just, ha you know, uh, kind of take, take their ball and go home and say, if we can't have our Rechtenwald-esque Mises Caucus party, then no Libertarian Party candidate this year. Um, and they got about 30 something percent of, I think 37 percent of the vote or something like that. So that represents that's that's the the core, hardcore Mises Caucus faction within the Libertarian Party can probably be identified with that. If the leading candidate at that point in the game had been a Mises Caucus person, I would have been none of the above too. So yeah, um, no. I respect it. So that, I guess that speaks to the like the level of of division that's that's still there. Um, I will say Chase Oliver himself is trying to be a bridge builder here. When I talk to him uh, there, which uh, I'll have a forthcoming video where I include some of these interviews, but he told me that he acknowledges that a big turning point for the Libertarian Party was the COVID-19 pandemic and that the Mises Caucus faction felt that the messages coming out of the Libertarian Party at that time were weak. They were uh, not sufficiently resistant to the COVID-19 restrictions and that they were going to fix that problem. And Chase Oliver is someone who, um, you know, is pro-vaccine. There's pictures of him now floating around wearing a mask, uh, which is like, um, <sighs> you know, God. I think there's a, a kind of 
sick dynamic now where like, you know, taking any COVID precautions whatsoever is now viewed by a, a faction of this party as uh, some sort of original sin. But uh, my bigger point is that uh, Chase said that, you know, he that the party did err in perhaps not being vociferous enough in airing some of that resistance and that he, uh, you know, his rhetoric, if you listen to him in the debates or any of the subsequent interviews he's given, he's not some wishy-washy libertarian. He's a hardcore libertarian. He's ex- he's an anti-war libertarian. Um, he doesn't parse words and he doesn't think that, uh, you, you know, he's not, he doesn't view the Mises Caucus libertarians as the enemy. Um, he views them as someone who he has disagreements with on issues like immigration, where that provided one of the kind of most fiery moments of the debate. He and Michael Rechtenwald and another Mises aligned candidate named Josh Smith clashed over immigration. And uh, Josh Smith in particular said, you know, uh, I'm an America first libertarian. America's full. And that got booze. And Chase's open immigration rhetoric got cheers. So I think the Libertarian Party as a whole is still on that page. Um, the you know a closed border Trumpist type immigration policy doesn't have a foothold in the the current instantiation of the Libertarian Party, and I, I think that's a very good thing. All right, to a close this uh, section now, um, I've uh, just a, a strange kind of reminder of that. You know, these elections, the election for the president, uh, see at the convention, it's decided by 900 people, right, on the floor. And a lot of these fights that we've been talking about, uh, internal uh, factions inside the Libertarian Party, it is really unclear uh, how much the 1% or so of people who reliably vote uh, Libertarian know about any of it or pay attention to it. The number of Libertarian Party members uh, compared to the number of Libertarian Party voters is just, it's incredibly lopsided. So it's a super open question. I don't know the answer of it, but it's worth thinking about. Joe Jorgensen got 1.18% of the vote. No one had ever heard of her. Um, And by the way, she was also like against all vaccine mandates like measles in, in schools and uh, and other things. She's was, a, uh, so you're saying party, she's a real soft leadership. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, that's what I'm saying. All right, let's get to our uh, listener email of the week here in a moment. Uh, but first, a reminder that this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Friends, do you remember that scene in Beverly Hills Cop where Axel uh, Foley, uh, as uh, portrayed by Eddie Murphy, uh, uh, put a banana in the tailpipe of the cops who were trying to follow him, thus rendering their car inoperable due to the blocked expulsion of the harmful gases from the exhaust manifold system? Well, imagine that you are the undercover sedan. The rancid gases are your secrets. And the banana is your refusal to let them out, thus reducing your internal engine to a sputtering and potentially flammable mess. Removing the banana is where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. BetterHelp is an easy-to-use, super-flexible, entirely online therapy service that has helped many listeners of this here podcast do some proper ventilation in order to more smoothly get through their day. All you have to do is fill out a quick questionnaire, get matched with a therapist. If you don't like the first one, you can just swap them out for a second. Let therapy help you get it all out with BetterHelp. Just visit BetterHelp.com slash roundtable right now to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder, please email your brief queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes with some edits from Tim Casey, who writes, living in an area that votes 80 plus percent blue, there's no elected members from any other party in my local government. Tim, do you live in my house? Uh, Do you think it makes more sense to vote for the good government types who definitely want to expand government, but at least show basic competence in governing and trying to use data to make decisions and assess results, even if they want to expand government or go for the wild candidates who are at the vanguard of political and social warfare and likely to drive the area into a ditch? Basically, do we crash the car so badly to maybe have a chance of fixing it? or keep filling the tire with air chugging along. Thanks, and looking forward to the DC show in a couple of weeks. It's sold out 
DC show, I might add. Uh, that's from Tim. Zach, I'm going to let you go first. You live in in contested areas, um, at least uh, like a, as a state, but I don't know what your local situation is like. What do you say to well, Tim? Well, I've become very anti crash the car in most cases. Uh, when you do that, the risk of never getting a better car isn't worth it. Um, however, I tend to think that's more of a problem at the national level right now. Um, I don't know that voting for a local Yahoo for city council or whatever is actually going to ever result in some unfixable disaster. And so I think you have to be strategic. Like if there's someone who is a little wild, but they're like really good on one issue that matters a lot to you, then it might be worth it depending on what the position is that they're seeking. If it's a ex very powerful position and they really could crash the car into the ditch, then I would say no. But um, there are definitely cases where I think the sort of wild vote is worth it. Nick, you have no idea who your no, city council right. member is. I, I'm a say? big fan of voting for the person that you feel most uh, expresses your inner longings and ideological commitment. So I would vote for whoever is on the ballot who is uh, closest to that. And uh, if not, I often cast ballots without filling in votes and uh, you know, write in that none of the above. I hope that is more common where you can officially vote for none of the above. But no, I, uh, you know, I vote libertarian almost all the time because I tend to believe closest to whatever the person calling themselves a libertarian is. And I would recommend people do that. It's always good to have uh, alternative voices out there and on the ballot. And the more votes they get, the more likely they will be there the next time with more uh, people and more votes behind them. Catherine, let me try to guess what you're going to recommend. Uh, you know what I'm going to say, which is don't vote. But I will say uh, I drove up to New York this weekend with my family. Uh, we got a tack in our tire. Uh, and so this, uh, this example... Uh, feels a little on point. Um, we did not, upon getting a tack in our tire, crash the car so badly to see if there was a chance of fixing it. We we patched the tire and we kept driving. Uh, and that uh, is a little bit of, uh, I guess, Matt, you might say it's where the rubber meets the road. Um, sorry. Ouch. I'm sorry. Peter's have... not here. I have to do my best. Um, th here's the thing, though. It's got to yeah. be slower I, than that. I, yeah. Oof. Uh, at the national level, I think we've seen the fruits of vote for the wackos um, just as a as an expressive matter. And um, they have both made the situation more unstable and largely not accomplish any of the goals that they share with libertarians. Um, this is the national level. So you might say locally it's going to go differently, but I'm not sure that's true. I actually think unless you have some belief that the wild candidates are going to achieve something in line with your values and not just be disruptive, that um, that, that that's not a good enough reason. Nick is right. You should vote for um, who you think aligns with your values if you must vote at all. But I, I think the if everything gets crazy enough, it will get better. If everything gets bad enough, it will get better. That that doesn't work. That does not work. And we should not pretend that it works. We can see all around us examples of why it does not work. Uh, I will uh, uh, share my uh, approach, uh, among other things, which is that I don't, regardless of someone uh, aligns otherwise with my kind of uh, like ideas about public policy, if they're a bad person, if I have reason, good reason to believe that they're, that they just kind of suck as a person, I'm not going to vote for them. Um, uh, I, but voting, I think, is far less uh, important than uh, participation. Um, people are, I think, hung up on voting. I don't want to say that I'm influenced by Catherine because that would be a lie. Uh, but uh, people are hung up on voting as this sort of like a, a end all be all signal of what they do. Um, believe it or not, writing emails and calling your local representatives who totally disagree with you about everything. But doing that is it, it gets noticed to some degree. And even more than that, showing up at the public, the horrible, boring, terrible public meetings and sitting through all the gadflies of which you are definitely one or will be uh, soon enough um, is has uh, infinitely more influence uh, than that. I mean, even if you don't vote at all, uh, pull a Catherine. But, uh, you know, talking in your social network of people who are in the same voting constituency area and trying to convince them one way or the other or make them think about certain aspects of the vote is uh, is much more of a potent exercise than I'm going to click this box instead of that. And if you are going to write people in, 
I recommend uh, writing in uh, Kennedy, MTV's uh, Kennedy, uh, Fox uh, Network's Kennedy, whenever possible, uh, if she happens to represent you, um, or and or Kat Timpf. Uh, I think I voted for both of them as many times as humanly possible for all of the district and superior court judgeships in the great state and city of New York. Um, all right. Uh, is it uh, me here or were there a lot of like kind of significant people who died over the last week? Uh, I think it might be me just because Bill Walton, the basketball mm. and broadcasting legend, vegetarian. died uh, as was announced vegetarian socialist uh died uh and uh and i was watching basketball yesterday so i, I, I kind of got i'll cut up my feels and i'll talk about that in a second but other people of significance have died uh, nick why don't you lead us in a round of talking about some of the people who died yeah i uh am going to talk about morgan spurlock the uh acclaimed documentarian who's uh, early 2000s Movie 2004 Super Size Me was featured Jacob Solemn Reason's own, uh, kind of contradicting the main thesis of the documentary in there. But um, my older son in particular has been forced in, you know, 21 years of schooling or whatever they go through. He had to watch that like every 15 minutes. Um, and it still is a big part of the kind of K through 12 curriculum. What's fascinating about it, this is where Spurlock, uh, you know, ate McDonald's for 30 days, only McDonald's, and any time at the time they had a promotion uh, asking if you wanted to supersize your order where they would, you know, throw on another dollop of whatever they were serving you, and he would always say yes. Um, there's a particular scene in that movie, um, and he died of cancer uh, recently, but uh, he was 53. But he die uh, in the movie. He goes to his doctor, and the doctor says that his liver functions are obscene. Uh, the The actual phrase was, "It looked your liver looked like an alcoholic's after a binge." And Morgan Spurlock in the documentary is like, "Oh, you know." And it's like it turns out that during the making of that movie, Morgan Spurlock was an alcoholic and had been drinking since he was thirteen. Uh, he uh, later said that he had not been sober for more than a week in 30 years. He said that in 2017. Um, and so this is one of the great, you know, it's a great documentary in many, many ways. It's a participatory thing. You can see how it's very much in the tradition of Michael Moore, who I'll get to in a second. But documentary films, the better they are and the bigger they are, oftentimes the faker they are. And Super Size Me was a profoundly fake documentary. Um, and I think that's worth remembering, you know, at the, at the time of Morgan Spurlock's death. I say this as somebody who actually enjoyed a lot of his subsequent work. A couple of years after that on FX, he had a fantastic uh, series called 30 Days, where he would pair people and put them in, you know, kind of riffing off the super size me thing where he ate McDonald's for a month. He would send people to live in an uncomfortable situation for, you know, for a month. Uh, and there was a great episode, for instance, I think most of these are online in various places, where he sent somebody who hated guns to go live with a family, a rural family that had a lot of guns. And it was fantastic drama. It was like he oftentimes started to take right and left wing kind of verites and would kind of force people to recognize that they weren't, you know, that the other side was human. So I'm not saying he was like a truly horrible person or anything. In 2017, clearly about to be canceled, he also came out with a Me Too statement where he essentially resigned from his company and talked about various experiences he had had. Um, and that ended, effectively ended his career. So it's like a, a weird and sad career arc ending, you know, most sadly and tragically in a young death from cancer. But uh, his death and particularly the popularity of Super Size Me and its fakeness is something that we need to always be grappling with. I mentioned uh, Michael Moore, his Bowling for Columbine documentary is a good example of this, where he faked significant amounts of the speech and the and the uh, action you know where he goes to a bank and opens a, a bank account and walks out with a gun like that's not actually how it happened uh you know going back to one of the first the clan i'm sorry i obviously care a lot about documentaries one of the very first modern documentary films nanak of the north uh which thankfully now you only watch that if you go to a film school uh that was a completely faked 
documentary as well about Eskimos and among other things that had, uh, you know, and these are bizarre and amazing, like the, the, in the, in the context of the movie Nanook, who was not actually Nanook, it was another guy who lived in a house, but he had them build igloos to live in, to film and things like that. And they would shoot fish and whales and seals with guns, but he made them go out with spears to do it. But there's a scene where Nanook's plural wives are trailing behind him. And they're actually the white director's common law wives. I mean, it's just like, it, <laughs> you know, the entire history of documentary film, with the exception of the things that Zach Weismuller and Reason TV does on a daily basis, <sighs> are so phony. And this goes back to Matthew Brady stage, so many of the photographs in the Civil War, Robert Capa, the great photographer, documentary photographer of the Spanish Civil War, faked most of his most famous images, raising Iwo Jima, faked. I mean, like we, the flag at Iwo Jima, uh, we should take, you know, Morgan Spurlock's death, Spurlock's death to, you know, extend our condolences to his friends and family, but also to level up on our media criticism, because most of the things that we are told in an information age are either absolutely fake or they are so framed in a way as to be almost completely misleading. We need to have a better bullshit detector. And, you know, maybe that will be Morgan Spurlock's uh, greatest legacy. Check out the uh, counter documentary Fathead, by the way, a guy made a documentary where he went and ate McDonald's and then lost weight. Uh, so that's that was the great thing about that era of like big documentaries is there would always be like the counter documentary. And that's actually a really good one. A Swedish team of researchers did a, uh, a study uh, where they fed Swedes. So, you know, go figure. But uh, 6000 calories of McDonald's food a day for 30 days. Most <laughs> oh of the people God. actually lost weight on it and, and all of their vitals went better. Um, I, and I, not to extend this too long, uh, go Google, uh, you know, false claims in Al Gore's Academy Award winning An Inconvenient Truth. We've all forgotten about Al Gore. Um, but uh, that movie also filled with absolute fakery to such a degree that a court in England ruled that it could not be marketed as a documentary. Uh, I think the masseuse industry in Portland, Oregon, uh, yeah. remembers Al Gore very well. <laughs> Big tipper. Big uh, tipper. Zach, Zach, you uh, are a documentary filmmaker. What uh, what person uh, died uh, or what uh, <laughs> thing died <laughs> in the last week yeah, of so, interest? Uh, I'd like to mourn the passing of Kabosu, the Shiba Inu doggy yeah. who became a meme and eventually the face of Dogecoin. Uh, Kabosu is just... A wonderful testament to the fun and weirdness of internet meme culture and also to cryptocurrency. Um, Do Dogecoin to me is the prime example, of, or well, it is the prime example really of what's become known as the meme coin where its, it's value derives just from the humor of Dogecoin having value. Uh, and that, that was good enough for Elon Musk, who threw his support behind it and pushed its mark market value up to about $8 million at one point. Um, and I think Dogecoin was meant to make fun of cryptocurrency and that kind of parody is also really valuable because yeah, there's a lot of trash and scam coins out there. And I happen to think not all of it is trash and in particularly see Bitcoin as transformational, something that's only grown in importance. I like what a lot of the privacy centric coins like Zcash and Monero are doing, but I welcome the commentary and levity from Dogecoin, and I mourn the loss of Kabosu. Rest in peace, Doggo. Uh, Catherine, uh, who died um, in your world? I, I want to uh, mourn the loss of uh, Richard Sherman, which is not a name I knew uh, until he died uh, last week, but he uh, died at the ripe old age of 95. He was um, a kind of a, a musical... Um, musical film powerhouse uh i particularly uh honor and mourn him for his work on mary poppins if you uh have sung supercalifragilisticexpialidocious ever um thank this man uh just a very cool story uh he worked with his brother for many years he was the child of uh of immigrants of russian jewish immigrants in new york city uh he also did write and i guess this is um maybe more of a jeer than a cheer the song it's a small world which oh no no cheer according cheer, to cheer. time magazine 
There's just one moon and a golden sun, and a smile means friendship for everyone. Oh my God, God. Matt, I'm so happy. I, I did have a, a music box as a child that played it. I also feel some affection. According to Time Magazine, it may be the most publicly performed song in history. So um, rest in peace, Richard Sherman, who brought us um, Mary Poppins, Jungle Book, Winnie the Pooh, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Bedknobs and Broomsticks, and It's a Small World. And you know what? He's right. It is. Doye mali mali sviet. So, uh, just quickly, Bill Walton was awesome. Uh, one of the best basketball players to ever live. He once went on a five-year uh, winning streak, high school, college, uh, where he didn't lose a game that he played in, uh, which is incredible. San Diego High School, uh, uh, college at UCLA, famously um, had one of the greatest uh, games ever played Ugh. in the uh, uh, NCAA finals against the Sixers. Sonic. Fuck you! Uh, no, I'm. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. While well, also in Game finals, Six of grunting, uh, yeah, foul-mouthed. Greatness. Um, uh, no, he played against Memphis State, I think it was, in the NCAA finals. He made 21 out of 22 baskets. Catherine, that's really good. Thank you. Um, went to UCLA. Uh, but what's really fascinating, played uh, in, at the Portland Trailblazers uh, uh, and won a very unlikely um, uh, NBA championship there that is, Nick, uh, it's still it's yeah. a little bit too soon for him uh, as a as George, <laughs> George McGinnis. McGinnis. Uh, no, I, I'm anti George uh, McGinnis. <laughs> Had good biceps, and that's it. He couldn't fucking play defense. Uh, uh wow! That it's, Sixers just, team should have thing. been like a dying. I mean, we should be talking. There should have been a TV show based around the Seventy Sixers uh, with uh, Doctor J and later Moses Malone. But uh, Bill Walton dies yesterday, and it's amazing just to go anywhere on your social media. He's like was the number one trending person. Everyone was just coming out of the woodwork with the most insane stories about this guy. He was famously, we alluded to before, a vegetarian kind of socialist. He was a Vietnam protester who would like, as in the middle of his uh, UCLA fame, would get arrested. And uh, Coach Wooden, John Wooden, the most ballyhooed and successful uh, NCAA coach, would have to go bail. And he's like, who was super straight edge, had to go bail him out. Um, he, uh, there's a great book called uh, The Breaks of the Game by David Halberstam about uh, the NBA and the Portland Trailblazers, uh, where it's pointed out that basically Bill Walton comes to UCLA, uh, you know, Coach Wooden has to have everyone with short hair and like super uh, regimented. And Walton's like, I would like to grow my shaggy red hair out and I need a uh, coach to smoke a lot of weed after every game because it's the only way that to calm me down. And Wooden's like, that's against the rules. All right. <laughs> like it's just that is the pyramid of success managerially if your star player is that good let him smoke the weed like it's it's fine um he was just like a totally it's also crazy reasons hr character policy character and has been for a long time he wrote it uh he uh uh uh, went into broadcasting despite having a horrifying stutter, which he coached himself out of. It was a huge deadhead. I saw him at one of the two deadhead sh dead shows that I went to. He was like uh, playing hacky sack in center field of Anaheim Stadium. Uh, just a crazy person that, that uh, exuded this uh, kind of love and and weirdness and wonder. Uh, and it's just a marvel uh, to see uh, people responding to him without at, at all even referencing his basketball skills, which are pretty enormous. Great. Passing big man, Nick Gillespie, yeah. you should know. That no, no, I, I, he's, he made he made the world really a lot weirder. Um, he mm -hmm. was part of that vanguard of 1970s athletes who just pushed the envelope and he pushed it as much as anybody else. Go ahead. Yeah. So, no, I was I was going to say that, you know, there are change agents and uh, weird agents and he just made America. He made it safe to be weirder and more wonderful and to I mean, to just to open up everything to so many different ways of looking at the world and moving through it and whatnot. Um, you know, I hate him because every time he won, it seemed like a team I marginally cared about lost and, uh, what a great person and a great American. Yeah. Uh, and just that there's nobody in the world with this guy, uh, you know, with, who has a pretty weird profile. Um, there's nobody in America who wasn't anything except just like high-fiving him saying that he's awesome. Like America understands that 
Bill Walton's are awesome, even if their politics don't necessarily line up. It doesn't matter. Awesome guy. All right. Let's go to our end of a uh, quick round, please, of our end uh, of a uh, show, what we have been consuming in the cultural uh, sphere. Catherine, why don't you lead us off by example? I uh, went to Ellis Island. Uh, my family and I were in New York to do Woo. some touring. We also uh, saw a lot of attractions uh, besides Ellis Island. But I really, really enjoyed the uh, totally not updated exhibits that were just like, hey, um, you know what? It was really hard to come here. And um, the people who came here were pretty awesome. Uh, and they went through a lot of stuff. And here's some of the stuff they went through. Um, I had not really focused previously on the the detentions at Ellis Island, people who were kept there, um, especially unaccompanied women and children until someone would basically come claim them. A man would come claim them. Um and um, some were there for a long time. Uh, also, families where one person was ill but could potentially recover and be allowed to stay. So they were sometimes separated, sometimes all uh, detained on Ellis Island. Um, just really kind of super inspiring. I think Matt has already recommended the Ellis Island Museum on this podcast in the past. So I am uh, I'm seconding that recommendation. And because I am um, a jerk, I'm going to throw in a second fast recommendation, which is uh, when my tire sprang a leak, I stopped in uh, Fast Tire Services uh, on Pulaski Highway in <laughs> Newark, and they fixed my tire, and they had the most delicious taco stand you can imagine. I had a, a, a tongue taco at the tire shop that was so good that it made me love immigration even more. So it's the same recommendation. It's Ellis Island. And the taco stand at the tire shop together, making America great. Nick, uh, I'm, I'm, I will go to you next just because of the New Jersey connection. Uh, although I, I have to reject the idea that uh, New Jersey has the best possible taco. But go ahead. Yeah. It was so good. Newark uh, also has a lot of Portuguese immigrants. It's a good place for Portuguese food. Uh, the one thing I wanted to say about Ellis Island, uh, Catherine, and since you did too, was uh, one of all of my uh, relatives came through Ellis Island and one of the things that was interesting before Ellis Island was kind of opened up as a big park, and that was done uh, after Lee Iacocca, and there was a mini series about Ellis Island with Richard Burton. It's like a terrible made for TV mini series where they refurbished a lot of it. Um, my grandparents never had a bad word to say about Ellis Island. It was interesting. And the first time I went there, it, it was like a real disjuncture because it's kind of downbeat, even as it's celebrating all of the people who passed through there and millions and millions of people, but it seemed everybody was dour. And um, it's just the, the. I guess maybe it's because they're the ones who got through, but they had a very different relationship to it, which I found interesting. They do have this statistic they say over and over, which is that they only, um, they only sent back 2% of the, of the seekers there. And I do think that's fascinating. Also had to be paid for by the ship companies. If if you're you they paid for um, holding people in Ellis Island and they paid for you to go home if you weren't approved, which is an interesting outsourcing. Of yeah, some that's a model of kind of indemnifying uh, things like that. Uh, and you know, up to somewhere between twenty five and forty percent of the people who came over from Europe from eighteen eighty to nineteen twenty four went back on their own. So it's uh, you know the immigration narrative is fascinating and very different from what we are. I went to a very uh, somber uh, thing over uh, last week. Uh, it was uh, the Nova exhibition, and this is in downtown Manhattan, <clears throat> and it is a recreation of the Nova Dance Festival, uh, which is where Hamas killed 1,200, uh, killed and kidnapped, uh, uh, you know, over 1,000 uh, partygoers, uh, including some Americans, but, you know, mostly Israelis and, and people from other countries. And it is, uh, it's in the financial district. It is a fascinating uh, exhibit that recreates what the Nova Dance Festival was like and what it felt like to be there as Hamas shows up. Uh, deeply, deeply moving. And one of the things that is most amazing about it is that it is um, the, the Nova tribe is a kind of dance collective. Um, and they, their slogan is, we will dance again which is pretty powerful and it's it's remarkable i highly recommend people see it and it is not it is um you know there is so much sadness and anger and things like that but it is a remarkably inclusive gesture it's about getting to peace not about getting revenge um and it's really 
uh, you know, I, I almost don't want to talk about like the technical brilliance of it because that seems to take away from the message, but just an incredibly uh, well done and powerful commemoration of, you know, a truly horrific act uh, whose, you know, meaning is still unfolding in world events. All right. Uh, Zach, what did you consider? Um, I'm reading a book called Argentina, a Modern History by Jill Hedges, which is exactly what the title sounds like it is. Um, I'm trying to under better understand why it is, how it is today. Um, and in short, it's just decades of uh, populists taking control, building a personality cult, and then getting overthrown by the military, and then rinse and repeat. Um, I mean, we've all seen the movie Evita, I assume, so you can understand like that these cults kind of come up around certain family names, uh, whether it's uh, Kirchner or Perone, uh, but even at the more local level, that it's like your name means a lot in Argentina. And obviously, we never want to get into that populist military coup cycle, but um, we, we've also, you know, uh, when you think about Millet, um, his name did not uh, mean much before he jumped into politics. So he he really is an outsider in that sense that he doesn't fit that model. He's now trying to build a little bit of a, you know, movement around himself a, as a figure. Um, there's also just decades of uh, every bad economic policy that a libertarian can think of being implemented and then taken back and implemented again. And so there, there's a there's a huge uh, history of uh, bad ideas that uh, he's got to overcome. And uh, it's yet to be seen if if he's up to that challenge. But um, it's uh, it, it, it's a really good book for for anyone who's wondering, you know, how how Argentina ended up with with this guy at the helm and with the kinds of inflation that they're still uh, dealing with. So I watched the uh, end of obesity uh, special by the uh, South Park uh, guys uh, that came out a few days ago. Uh, I watched it with my 15 year old uh, daughter, uh, which I uh, highly recommend doing, although I'm not renting her out currently. Um, uh, it just depends. Uh, really, really funny. Um, and uh, it, I mean, it, it's amazing that after all these years that they are still uh, even pretty funny, let alone uh, or even funny, let alone uh, pretty funny. Um, uh, it's the, the it's all about like Cartman learns that there's Ozempic and wants to get it because he can imagine uh, a world in which people can't call him fat ass anymore. And so uh, then they have to go. They go to the doctor. Uh, but uh, the doctor says you can't. Uh, get it uh, by prescription because they're not giving it to people for obesity. You have to get it through other ways. Uh, thus, a great song and dance number about navigating the American healthcare system, which is one of the best critiques of the U.S. healthcare system I've ever seen. Uh, really, really good. Uh, I just enjoyed it because I don't watch South Park regularly anymore, um, that the little... Um, Things on the side that don't even need to be there are so hilarious and good, especially if they have anything to do with music. Like there's a a, a throwaway song being played in the background uh, as they're showing a factory in India that is making the super glutides or whatever they're called. Um, and the song in India, it's just just so wrong and funny and great. Um, so I very much enjoyed it and also enjoyed the reaction from uh, Lizzo. Uh, Pop uh, Music's Lizzo, who did a, filmed a reaction video because at some point everyone's trying it. It gets the black market drugs, and then there's gangs, and there's shoot 'em ups. Uh, at at some point, the uh, the alternative to getting the drug is to take a different drug called Lizzo, in which it, it gives you acceptance of how fat you are, so you don't care anymore. Um, and so she's like, "Uh oh, I'm going to watch this, and I'm I'm really worried about it." And uh, her uh, ultimate takeaway, and I'm going to read a quote. And Fred Young, if you're listening out there, cover your ears um, because there might be some curse words in here. Uh, it says, "It really, I really showed the world how to love yourself and not give a fuck to the point where these men uh, uh, in Colorado know who the fuck I am and put it on their cartoon that's been around for 25 years. I'm really that bitch, and I show you how to not give a fuck, <laughs> and I'll keep showing you how to not give a fuck." She was super psyched, and I again. America uh, is uh, America F. Yeah, Fred Young. Uh, uh, it's pretty great. That's uh, kind of a great uh, right, uh, a book note to Morgan Spurlock passing. Yeah. 
Uh, exactly right. Like uh, put it all put it all together, uh, but hopefully uh, don't die. I, I was on Morgan Spurlock's uh, podcast like five years ago or so. He's a, a very very nice guy. I was uh, uh, very surprised by the interaction with him. But anyways, R.I.P. to everyone uh, who died. Uh, and uh, speaking of dying, that's the dying minutes of this podcast here at the Reason Roundtable. Uh, catch us next week. Um, you can't see us live unless you get on the waiting list and the waiting list clears, but that's still a possibility. Go to reason.com slash events for our June 6th show in Washington, D.C. Uh, Nick, are there any other events that you would like to talk about yeah, in the New York City area? Yeah, uh, uh, Reason Speakeasy, a live interview with... Uh Cory DeAngelis, the uh, fantastic school Ooh. choice activist who has a new book out called The Parent Revolution. That's on June 11. Go to reason.com slash events and get the details and uh, come out and ask him a tough question. And keep uh, mashing the refresh button at reason.com because we'll be seeing some more reportage from uh, Zach Weissmuller uh, from the uh, Libertarian Party Convention and related uh, 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 things. Uh, all of our podcasts, including Zach's, including Nick's, uh, reason.com slash podcasts. You know the drill. Thanks for listening. See you next week.